going to do? Not this week. That's going to that's going to be a live stream. Uh, unlimited power. But no. No, maybe soon. And definitely another live stream. Well, I forgot I had this. Yeah, sure. Why not? So right now you can see me, I'm just trying to figure out where I want to place the tractor on this. I knew I wanted to rust it up and make it look super old and like it had just been parked there and forgotten about. Um, maybe something happened and a gasket blew or maybe a hole in the, I don't know, gas tank or something, I don't know. They just parked it there and forgot about it. Um, I wanted to point out that you can use toothpicks to do the uh, fence posts like what we end up doing in the final version. You just drill some holes, glue the toothpicks in, and then clip them off at the height that you want them. For this scale, I felt that the best way to do this was going to be with Evergreen. Uh, Evergreen is a styrene product. I'll be using these nice thick square rods. They come in all different shapes and sizes from I-beams to tubes to whatever you can think of. They're a really great product. They're the exact same thing that Hollywood does when they want to build scale models for movie making. Now when working with styrene or pretty much any product, I recommend doing what I refer to as a mother cut. Now you'll see the initial piece that I held up, that is my mother, my master, and I'm going to use that for measurements for cutting out all my pieces to ensure they're as close to the original length as possible. Now I could have gone down the line and made marks on this styrene and marked out how many I was going to need. But the reality of the fact is, is that as you work with styrene, you'll realize that different tools cut styrene in different ways, whether it be pinching, removing product, whatever the case is, it's going to affect the way it cuts. So in my opinion, when working with styrene, if you're going to do a bunch of similar cuts, you can either invest in something like a micro mark, or you can use a masterpiece to use as your reference for making all of your cuts. Next we need to decide where we're going to place things out. Now I wanted to put some kind of cross beam on one of these pieces so I knew roughly about the length of one of my pieces long was how far apart I was going to need them. This ended up allowing me to put about three of them on. So I marked my outside spaces. I had marked the middle but it ended up not being where I needed it to be. So you can see that third mark way out in the side, that's indicating which one of those two marks I'm actually using to ensure that I glue my pieces down where they need to end up. Now typically when we use uh, hot glue in this hobby, it is very sparingly. One of the tips that I have acquired from this is you want to use enough to get it stuck but you also want to blend it in with its surroundings. So you can see there, I'm mushing it around, I'm spreading it out, I'm making sure it gets a nice flat foot. This is going to make sure that as we add more product around it, it's going to help lock it down and it's gonna make a nice deep recess for it to stick to. So one of the great things about styrene is because it's basically what model kits are made out of, you can use model glue to glue styrene together. Now I wanted to make sure I got a really nice good thick bond so what I'm basically doing here after I cut a 45 degree angle is I'm using some model glue that has had sprue melted down in it. So it's basically creating a plastic slurry and this does a really really good job at helping to lock everything together. Uh, it also dries a little bit faster when you do this. So you just want to line your piece up as best as you can and then you're going to have to just hold it in place until it dries. Now once it does dry you can clip it off flush using some flush cutters like I do. Um, again you can see just how quick that bond occurred. It didn't take long at all. I would have been holding that way longer had I not used the slurry technique. And I, trust me, this stuff does dry really crazy fast, but it also does work really well for filling gaps. So in the case here, where I may not have had my vertical sticks quite lined up perfectly, and it may have left a gap by making this cross strut, 
this has actually filled in those gaps and held things together much better than it would have. Now you can just see me reinforcing, making sure that everything got a good even coating of plastic glue there with some regular plastic glue. It doesn't have anything melted into it, but it's just a really great technique to bring, especially when you're doing scratch builds like we are with this fence. Now that we have that main support out of the way, I want to start laying in some cork. Now I have some extra thin cork here, and this is just cork sheeting that you can get from most hobby stores. Um, you may find it in thicker amounts, that's fine, but I'm going to be putting two layers on and I'm going to alternate that broken pattern. And I'm doing that so that it basically makes it look as though the edge of the road bed has started to erode away. This is an old farm road, not a lot of people are on it, it doesn't get maintained that often, etc, etc. On the first layer we want to use hot glue. This is just going to make sure it locks into that wooden surface and doesn't just peel away. And then on the second layer, because super glue soaks into cork, I just use super glue for the second layer. So now we want to put in all of our dirt texture. Now if you can afford to use sterling mud, go for it. I personally know that for a project this large, I don't want to be using sterling mud for that. So I've mixed up my own equivalent to Sterling Mud. We'll make a video at some point in the future talking about how to do this. There are plenty of other channels that have also done this. Feel free to go check out their breakdown. Now one thing I have noticed is that when you do the homemade version, it does have a tendency to crack. So the thinner you put it on, the less likely it's going to crack, and the less time you're going to spend cleaning things up after the fact. Off camera I ended up smoothing things out just using a wet finger and just kind of sliding it across the surface to kind of smooth things out and then I realized that I had overdone it um, and so I came back in and I knew, knew I needed to record this and I just didn't think to throw the camera in the jig but uh, so basically I'm using a damp brush to kind of lightly pad the surface and, and this is just going to bring some texture back into the project. So if you think you've got too much texture, you can smooth that out with a wet finger and just kind of go over everything. And if you overdo it, you can bring some of that texture back with a wet brush and just kind of stipple at the surface. This is the point where we really start to receive the fruits of our labor in the total project. And I am going to skip forward here a little bit. Anything that has to do with basing from this point forward, um, we're just going to kind of show it in high speed at the very least. Otherwise, this video is going to take forever. I've done lots of videos on basing before, but if you guys want me to do more videos on basing, I'll be more than happy to do that. I'll order some large GW bases for like the size of an Imperial Knight, and you guys can just give me ideas on what you want to see, whether it be like graveyards, industrial, whatever, and we'll make some videos and we'll talk about different ways that you can make bases. Here I'm just laying in some base tones and just knocking out all the colors for the road and the dirt texture and getting it to the place that I want it. In the event that some of the static grass starts to break down and maybe come off with time, I want to make sure that that brown is still there. Now only because this is a topic we haven't really talked about, typically farmers don't keep the rocks in their field. I mean that makes sense when you think about it, it tears up the equipment. So if you're going to do something like this where something has been farmland at some point, and you've got a fence line, put a lot of rocks around the fence line because farmers would be kicking the rocks, moving the rocks, dumping the rocks away from the field, moving them to the edge of the field, or even having a rock pile near their house. Or in a lot of cases, that's why there's rock walls around farmland is because that's the rocks that have been pulled from the field. Here I'm just stippling on some grays to add some texture to the road and I go a little bit too bright so I end up putting a black wash on top of everything to knock it back down and I was pretty happy with where it ended up. Very quickly here we start rusting up the tractor so I'm not really going to talk about how I rust up the fence because I do the exact same techniques on the tractor that I do on the fence so we just won't talk about that. You can get fake barbed wire like this from a model train shop or a lot of mini wargaming stores will actually even carry it. I'm going to be using this stuff known as granny grating which is basically the stuff that's used for cross stitch. You can also get this in the screen door section and we're just going to be cutting it up and painting it up to make it look like a metal fence. So once the fence has its first layers of paint on it I want to try to rough up the bottom, make it look old, punch a couple holes in it. And then I'm basically leaning it up against these bottles like this to make it a little easier for me to deal with it, to kind of lock it all into place. 
I end up applying super glue to the post and then laying it in place. Now you want to be careful when doing this. If you use a accelerant, it's going to fog the glue. So you just really got to hold it until it actually locks into place. Now I want to take a second to apologize. Normally the video would be ending at this point, but I knew there was a lot of information that I wanted to cover and I want to start doing more uh, start to finish videos where you see everything all the way through. Now there are times where it's appropriate to break things up and to do multiple part videos even though YouTube's not a big fan of doing multiple part series. Um, but there's just a lot of information to get across in a video like this as we're doing a lot of techniques that I haven't covered on the channel before and not necessarily that all of them are new techniques meaning that things we have not covered before but they're techniques that we have covered before in a new way and it's just the evolution of your hobby skill and taking things to the next level and as someone who typically only paints like miniature war games or D&D figures working on a model can really bring out a new side of the hobby for you because it's such a larger scale than anything you're used to working with which is another good reason as to why the video is taking so long maybe down the road I'll find a way to better cram things together in a way that makes sense but for now this was the fastest way that I could edit the video Moving right along, I'm going to spray the entire miniature with a dull coat. This is going to help to act like a primer layer for putting all our rust effects on, as I don't really want to heavily repaint the miniature. It's also going to help for the few places where I do add paint to the miniature to help it really stick. Glossy plastic like this tends to not be the best adhesion for paint and other materials that get added to it, so oftentimes we have to put some kind of a base coat down. In this case, it's Tester's dull coat. Now what you can see me here is I'm preparing my airbrush. I'm gonna be using Abaddon Black to kind of prime up the engine compartment and really darken it up, make it look like it's covered in grease and grime. Let a little bit of that red show through as it would have been painted factory red. Do our best to keep it off the tires, but really just to kind of get it in on all the places that would get dirty and grimy, we really want to knock that down. Again, as you can see, I'm not going super crazy, and I'm not worried about a little bit of overspray. That's fine, and I end up actually hitting the hood with a little bit of this dark black as well. We're then going to go through with several different washes and we're going to basically do the exact same thing. We're going to be hitting the miniature from all over and this is going to really help to make it look like it's weathered. Now I'll go ahead and put a list of those paints on screen now. Nuln Oil, Agrax Earthshade, Seraphim Sepia, Ethonian Camo Shade, and Reichland Flesh Shade. In an attempt to try and make the wood look like it had aged, I started out by painting it gray and we end up using a bit of a chalk pigment that is a custom mix from my how to make weathering pigments video on it later and that really helps to bring out the wood grain as well as to make it look aged, to make it look as though the grain has started to separate from itself and the wood is beginning to rot. It does a really wonderful job at that mix with this gray undertone. You can also see here I'm using a heavy pigmented wash. This is a panel line wash by Tamiya and I am just going ham with the brown color and just getting it all over. This is gonna help set the tone for the rust effects that we're about to start. So if you've seen me use AK Interactive's Rust Pigments before, you'll know that I say less is more. Now in the case of what we're doing now where this is heavily rusted out, this thing has been sitting outside its whole life, we kind of want to go a bit overboard and you want to have a lot of the pigments not necessarily melted in with our binder. Now what I'm using for a binder, I'm using rubbing alcohol, it does a really great job at helping to turn this almost into a paint like consistency. We're basically going to be applying this and as it dries it will just kind of blend in and mix in with the surface and make it look like it's a part of the metal or in this case a part of the plastic. Now if you really want to go ham and you want nice thick gridded rust, you just use less binding, you use less alcohol, you put it on in a thicker paste. 
and we're just going through and we're, we're anywhere where this red is at we're just gonna go ahead and put a good healthy coat of orange and we're not doing a hundred percent coverage uh, but we are gonna be doing probably about 75 to 80 percent coverage on just the orange alone and then with the other colors we're going to be putting it on top of the orange and staying away from the red so we're almost using this orange rust tone as like a mask for everything else that's going to come after for the tires we kind of want a less of an all over appearance on these rims and so I'm using the sponge technique similar to how you would do this with paint where you rip up a bit of a makeup sponge, you kind of blot it out on a paper towel and then you get these really nice randomized rust patterns and we're doing that on the outside specifically. You can go a bit more ham on the inside as they'll be less noticeable but on the outside like you can see it's giving us this really wonderful random pattern. Moving along into the red tones, like I said, we want to almost use the orange like a mask. As you can see, I'm putting in the last of my orange tones all over the steering wheel, all over that command console. And basically, then we're going to come in with uh, the red and we're going to mask off most of the orange with our red. We'll apply a little bit of the red in other places, but because the paint is a uh, red paint in both the concept art and the plastic is done in a red plastic, there's not a lot of sense in us going in and using this brick red pigment on anywhere that doesn't already have the orange as all it will do is add texture it's not going to really change the color and it's going to be so unnoticeable that it's really not worth doing so we're just going in and we're, we're covering up maybe 20 to 30 percent of our rust tones from the previous segment with the red and anywhere where you feel like you've done too much you can just go back in and add more orange on top of it once it dries and this stuff because we're using rubbing alcohol as a binding pigment it dries really quickly a while back we made a video talking about how to make your own weathering pigments now that's what I'm using here I could have used a snow based pigment but it would have been way too white with old tires they tend to kind of turn this mottled gray look before they just completely dry rot away um, I think it's something to do with just the way that they used to make tires way back in the day as I've noticed that new tires don't always necessarily turn gray something about the chemical compound of how they're made but basically we're just using this gray pigment all over these tires and just making them look old moving along to one of my favorite parts of this project and that's just because it really starts to bring some vibrancy to the whole thing and really tie it all together we want to start making this look overgrown one of the best ways to do this is literally to take out everything you've got any kind of foliage any kind of whatever you've got uh, if this diorama had been any bigger I would have been using these they're just awesome you can get them from Hobby Lobby they've got corn rows and they've got live corn and and they've got cattails and all kinds of really cool stuff. That brand is, is pretty neat. I think it's a Hobby Lobby brand, but I'm not 100% sure. And there's plenty of other companies that make stuff like that too. So if you don't want to support Hobby Lobby, which I understand why some of you may not want to, then you can take a look and find stuff like that in other brands. That's just what's available in my area. I've got a lot of stuff from Woodland Scenics, and I got a lot of stuff from Army Painter, and we're just gonna have fun laying in all this craziness. Now again, we've done plenty of videos on the channel. Well, I say plenty of videos. We've done three or four videos where I've really gone into depth about making bases and how we do that. So I'm just gonna skip forward past this portion. I'm gonna play it in high speed so you guys can kind of see what I'm doing, but I'm not really gonna talk about what I'm doing. If you guys really want to know more in depth about how to do stuff like this please just ask in the comments and we'll make a proper video about it where we just talk about basing and how to apply static grass and all that good stuff Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, I really love how this piece turned out. Uh, there's a few things that I might change in the future, but for now I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Um, the inside of the hood is all weathered up the same as it is on the outside and it all looks wonderful. I hope you guys think this is a cool project. I know it's not normally what we do. I know a lot of what we do is normally 
tabletop gaming related, but a lot of the techniques that we covered in today's video can definitely be applied to that, especially if you want to do a, uh, a diorama piece using your tabletop miniatures. I highly encourage you guys to do something like that because it makes you think about things in a way that you don't normally do and then you can actually really learn from it. And speaking of learning something, I hope you guys learned something from today's video. And if you've got any questions that have developed as a result of this week's video, go ahead and post those in the comments below and who knows, maybe you'll inspire a future episode. Now I do want you to be a bit transparent. The tractor was provided through a fan of the channel who bought it off my Amazon wishlist. You can do that and I will give you a shout out if you want. This patron decided that he didn't want a shout out but I really do appreciate them buying this model for me and inspiring this week's video. There's a lot of great ways to support this channel, but as always, there's a really great free way for you guys to do that, and that is to share the channel around with your friends, to like the video, to leave comments. All of that helps to boost us up in the algorithm and show this channel to more people than what would have found it normally. Thank you guys so much for all the love and support, and as always, I hope your display case is always full and your pile of shame never runs empty. Until next time. <laughs>